so thankful for the blood of Jesus. And uh, there's a lot of songs that go along with the blood of Jesus that uh, talk about how that he saves us. And uh, there was a song that kind of kept going over in my mind over the last few days about how he rescued me from the cold, dark waters of sin's troubled sea. I'm so thankful that Jesus reached down and rescued me. Amen. Praise God. One of the prerequisites of us being saved is realizing that we need to be saved. And sometimes people just don't realize that they're, you know, born in sin and shaped in iniquity. But, you know, what is sin? And, you know, sin doesn't really matter even if they knew what it was. And is there a God? And is there salvation? And what do you have to do to be saved? But all of those questions are answered in the Word of God. You'll find it in the Holy Writ. Praise God. You will find it in the Scripture. It'll talk to you about who you are, what you are, where you're at, and where Jesus wants to do or what He wants to do and where He wants to bring you and how He wants to bless your life and ultimately save you. I believe that the Lord is looking for the opportunity to look at humanity, each of us as individuals, and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. We're not, uh, we're not serving a God that doesn't want to be found. We're not serving a God that doesn't want to pour out blessing. We're not serving a God today that wants to keep salvation, you know, just uh, uh, to himself to be hidden or something like that. But for it to be something that mankind will find, amen, in him because he's the only Savior and the Savior soul. Praise God. I believe that the Lord is looking uh, to bless someone here today. You know, uh, things have been busy uh, lately, summer in Maine, summer in the Maine District of the United Pentecostal Church, summer in, in Calvary, and summer in homes. It's, it's a busy time. You know, we have good weather. And to be honest with you, I, I enjoy the four seasons. And uh, I enjoy, you know, uh, some better than others, but uh, I enjoy them all. And uh, winter is my least, but I still enjoy it. And uh, I really enjoy summer, and I love fall. Fall is great, and I suppose fall is my favorite season, and we're going to be approaching that pretty quickly. And I, I, I don't like to say that, but that's just what's going to happen. It's happened for the last 60-some-odd years that I've been alive anyway, and uh, probably is going to happen for a few more. And uh, so buckle in. Let's enjoy what God has for us and enjoy the seasons that God has blessed us with, but we're very, very busy, a lot of things going on. People are traveling, doing some vacationing and things of that nature. Matter of fact, John and Liz, the family, are in St. Louis, and they're enjoying some family time with uh, uh, Bob and Tammy Mason, the outlaws, I mean the in-laws, and uh, they're going to enjoy some time with them. And uh, let's just pray that the Lord will keep them and protect them and bring them back home safely. And all of those that are traveling and doing various things throughout, um, throughout the, the summer. Had a great time yesterday. Some of the guys got together. We did a, a four-wheel ride. And, uh, well, Larry, thank you so much for getting that together. We want it to grow and get bigger and all of that. But I just want to thank you because during that four-wheel ride, as I was riding down those trails and I could just look up, it, it was beautiful yesterday. It was beautiful. And, um, you know, driving along and, you know, you're going 30 miles an hour or something like that. We weren't going 60, 70, you know, that kind of thing. Though some wanted to. Um, we kept it at a relatively good rate of speed, didn't we, Brother Rob? I mean, for the most part. And But the wind's blowing on you, you know, and there's not, uh, you know, there's... You're involved in an activity with a group of guys, and there's not a whole lot more you can do. You can sit there and pray and thank the Lord for what he's done and, and all of that. And just kind of, it kind of uh, gave me a break. It really did. And so I'm looking up, and I got the goggles on, you know, and, the, and, and they were clear as, as could be. There wasn't a bug on there, you know, and that was kind of nice. And, uh, but I was able to look up, blue sky, it was great. It was great. The only thing that could have been better if my wife was with me. And uh, actually, she asked if she could go, and I said, well, dear, it's, it's a men's thing, and probably, but next time, we're going we're gonna to adjust things maybe a little bit and, and get all the ladies that want to go, too. That'd be a great time. We had a good time, anyway. It gave me a break that I needed, even if it was only for a few hours. It felt really good. And uh, Jason, thank you for all your input and 
my, my wheeler's covered with mud. And I thank you for that. And I hold you responsible for that because I was following you. And uh, they had a great time. Praise God. You know, uh, I bought some new readers this week. I was a big spender and I went to Dollar Tree. <laughs> And I've increased in a negative way. <laughs> I went from 1.75 1, to 2.0. And uh, I can see clearly now. You say, you don't have them on right now. No, no, I don't have them on right now, but I have my screen at 200%. So I'm able to... I'm, I'm able to get rid of the readers while I preach a lot of times because this option here of just making things, everything so much bigger. And even then, so I, I increased it from 150 to, to 200 today, actually. Praise God. You know, aging is a beautiful thing. Praise God. It puts us one day closer to the coming of the Lord. It puts us one day closer to the day that we will expire. You say, well, what's so great about that? Well, I'm going to tell you what. When we expire, we're going to go to be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And it's, it is not going to be a disappointing experience. Praise God. It's going to be great. Amen. Oh, wow. Amen. We have a hope. Praise God. Amen. It's beyond this world. And at times, my wife and I, and I'm just reminiscing a little bit, we will drive around a little bit, and that's come up to some of our pastime. We grab a cup of coffee, or we'll grab a uh, Diet Coke, or a Roma Joe, or something like that. And uh, anyway, we'll, we'll just ride around. During COVID, we must have put on a half a million miles, because we were just riding around in circles. But anyway, <laughs> it just increased what we normally do a lot of times. When we just want to relax a little bit, and we want to drive around. And we drive by the hay fields, and I remember being out there in the hay fields and throwing bales of hay on the back of the trailer. I said, you know what, I'd like to have a farm. And you begin to think about it, goats and chickens and pigs and all that kind of stuff. And you know, there's a lot of work in that. And now I'm driving by the lake yesterday and I'm looking at these people that have these boats and stuff, and I'm thinking, man, I'd like to have a boat. Look at that boat over there. And some of them are over there enjoying their picnic lunch, and it's, it's, it looks nice. It really does. And, and some of these guys are driving by with, they're not driving by with four-wheelers. They're driving by with little cars. They're, they're vehicles. They, they, they're no longer four-wheelers. They're just, and I think, well, that, that's not, I like that right there, you know. Kind of watching as I, I go by and, and go by some of those fields, some of those places, some of those campgrounds. It was beautiful. And I began to think, you know, I'd like to have some of that, and and yet, in this life here, we, we may not get those things. But there's coming a day. And I begin to think about it. And I said, Lord, a thousand years, we're going to be on this old earth. And there's going to be some of these things that I'm looking forward to. I'm going to be out there fishing during that thousand years. I'm going to be planting that garden and taking in those veggies. And I'm going to be driving that tractor. And I'm going to be taking care of those hogs. And I'm going to be doing all that kind of stuff one of these days. Can't, can't do it now, but plan on doing it later when the Lord comes and takes me on home. Praise God. I better get moving along here. They already started the clock in 6.3 6, 7 seconds. It's going fast. Let's get into the word of the Lord here today. Praise God. Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 and 2. Wherefore seeing we also are compassed about. I've been working you hard too, haven't I? I'm sorry. With so great a cloud of witnesses, thank you for your help. I do appreciate it. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Isaiah chapter number 59, verses 19 and part of 20. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. 
And the Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression. When the enemy shall come in, when he shall come in, you look this up, when he shall come in to abide, to live, or to dwell. He wants to stay a while. The Lord will lift up a standard against it or will cause it to abate. He'll cause it to vanish or he will put it to flight. I want to talk to you on this thought. Your nemesis is on the premises. Your nemesis is on the premises. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace. Let your word to be applied to our hearts and let us to draw closer to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you want to define nemesis, it's that inescapable agent of someone's or something's downfall. The whole idea of the nemesis is to defeat you, make you to fail. Premises is where you live. It's a house, building, together with all of its outbuildings, actually, occupied by a person or a or a business. Now, some of the creepiest stories that I have ever read are stories about frogging. Now, I'm not talking about people walking around Well, their frog outfits on and that kind of thing. It's not that. Anyone know what frogging is? Frogging is when people unwittingly shared their homes with intruders. That's called frogging. For many people, the idea that a stranger could be living in your home without your knowledge is one of the most terrifying scenarios that you could ever think of. Now, my mom and dad are not here today. My, my mom's not here. They're in, they're in West Virginia. They went to the, the uh, family reunion that was yesterday. And uh, don't go tell mom some of the stories I'm going to tell here, Okay. Because she will be looking under everything in that house, trying to find out who's living there that's not supposed to. So for the idea that there could be someone living in your home without you knowing about it, is quite the scenario. Unfortunately, for some individuals, this nightmarish situation has been a reality. They have become the victims of frogging or the act of a person secretly living in an unoccupied space without the resident's permission. Tina Bowen was convinced that the spirit of her deceased mother was speaking to her through the walls of her home in Pepperell, Massachusetts. For weeks, the teenager received cryptic messages scribbled onto the walls using condiments like mustard and ketchup and and things like that. Items mysteriously rearranged themselves around the house. Full bottles of alcohol suddenly became empty. They thought, oh, this place is creepy. It's haunted. But then on December the 8th, Bowen and her father returned home to find a bone-chilling sight. A stranger was found in one of their closets with a painted face, a strange jacket, a ninja mask, and a hatchet in his hand. But he'd been living there for weeks. A a college student known as Maddie in North Carolina believed that uh, that the strange things that she was experiencing fit all the hallmarks of a textbook paranormal, paranormal activity. Strange noises, missing clothing, unexplained handprints. At that time, she was living at the Summit at the Edge Apartments, not far from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. It would turn out that there was nothing paranormal about Maddie's experience. But the truth was far worse. A 30-year-old man named Andrew was secretly hiding in her closet. Hmm. 
don't know about you, but that sounds kind of creepy to me. <laughs> you ever listen to the radio early in the morning? 103.9 early in the morning. I don't know who those people are, but they've got some weird ideas and stories they start talking about. Hey, they fit right in. Tracy, a single mother of five, started hearing banging noise in her attic and assumed that a wild animal had crawled in or that the, the house was potentially haunted. Her sons and nephews went up into the attic to check, and to their surprise, they found a 40-year-old man sleeping up there. Actually, an ex-boyfriend. Hmm. Philip Peters a retiree of the Denver and Rio Grande uh, Western Railroad was home alone. And his children all grown up and moved out. His wife, Helen, was actually in the hospital, in a local hospital, after breaking her hip during a fall. Peters, Peters entered into his, his home that night to find a gaunt, disheveled man raiding his icebox. The two got into a fight which ended in Peters' death. Peters' neighbors actually found his body and later on and called the Denver police. But authorities could not find a sign of any intruder. And the investigation continued on and on. Helen was released from the hospital, now a widow, living alone in the same home, living alone in the same home where her husband was murdered. Before long, Helen began to experience strange things. Missing food, odd sounds, items not being where she had left them. And she became convinced that the house was haunted. And she finally moves out because it creeped her out so much with her son. And the house stood vacant. But neighbors kept hearing strange noises and, and strange things coming from the house. And by the time that the police were able to figure everything out, they found a man living there that was the murderer of her husband. Bizarre? Certainly is. Unthinkable? Certainly is. Terrifying? Absolutely. Makes you want to go home and check things, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Get the closet, make sure there's no one in there. The attic, those little secret places that, you know, they can kind of climb into. Mm, under the bed, etc. Maybe, just maybe, there's an enemy in your house. There's a possibility that there's a Nemesis in the, on the premises of your, of your life. You know, and you might think today, well, I really don't have any enemies. I'm a pretty nice person, nice guy, nice girl. You know, I don't, I don't have any enemies. Anybody here today, you don't think you have any enemies? Not one hand's gone up. Oh, Sister Kenny, you probably do not have any enemies because if there ever was a person on the face of this earth that shouldn't have enemies, it would be you. Absolutely. Amen. But for the rest of us, we're probably not quite so fortunate, but imagine if you would that your spiritual life is as a house and look at your neighbor and say you have adversaries. And uh, even Sister Kennedy has this adversary that we'll be talking about a little bit here today because you do have an adversary, the devil, that goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So you imagine that you have this spiritual life and it's as a house and it's beautiful, it's well built. But every now and then an unwanted guest, your nemesis, tries to sneak in. This nemesis could be anything that disrupts your peace of mind, that uh, hinders your spiritual growth. It's, uh, maybe it's a sin even or a temptation. Maybe it's a fear or doubt or some other negative influence in your life. And if you remember from our scripture reading about laying aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us, you can kind of see where we're going in this thought here today. Now, think of your nemesis as a persistent salesman. You ever run into those persistent salespeople? A lot of times you'll find them on the car lots. You'll ride, you just, you know, you're out riding around because, you know, they're scaring you to death with COVID. And you're out driving around just looking at vehicles, not intended to buy one. You're just intended to look at something, you know. 
And they don't put any prices on there because they don't want you to get the information. And, you know, from the art of the deal, if you read that book, you know, you know that whoever puts the first price out is the one that loses money in the deal. Did you know that? Hmm. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? So when you're thinking about selling something, what they're wanting you to do is they want, tell me what you can afford. Huh? That, that's what they do. Tell me what you can afford and I can find you something that I can sell to you. <laughs> And it's going to be for the exact amount that you told me you could afford. Amen. So think of your, your nemesis as that salesman. He keeps knocking on your door, keeps pestering you there at the car lot. Is there anything I do to help you? Are you interested in this? Are you interested in that? No matter how many times you say no, he keeps coming back. And this is similar to how temptations and sins try to invade our spiritual house. And so when Peter was writing, he said, be sober-minded and be watchful. When you go onto that car lot, be prepared. Have yourself a plan. Have yourself a goal. Have your, be willing to walk away. That's what they tell you. Be willing to walk away from the deal. Which, by the way, I could tell you a really cool story right now, but I'm not at liberty to do so. I wish I could, but anyway, I'm almost there. I won't do it. Uh, but no matter how many times they come and you say no, they keep coming back and you have got to, you've got to maintain your faith and your trust. You've got to maintain your sobriety and not become drunken with the thing that the tempter is bringing to you. Your adversary. Everybody say adversary. I got an adversary and he's a devil. He is the devil. And he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, just like the lion prowling around, our nemesis is always looking for a weak spot to attack. Most likely, he's not going to attack your strength, but he's going to come against your weakness. Everybody say weakness. That's what he's looking at, the place where I can get at you. You know how it is, even when you're wanting to proverbially poke the bear. When you want to poke the bear, where do you poke the bear? You poke the bear where it hurts the bear. You poke the bear where you get a rise from the bear, right? That's what you're trying to do. And so for those that may be thinking of getting married soon, you just might want to, no, no, wrong answer. We definitely need some counseling. You want to learn where not to poke the bear, okay? Okay. The enemy is looking for your vulnerability, your weakness. It's that besetting sin, the sin that easily troubles you, the thing that easily grieves you, or in context to the scripture, the thing that surrounds you. Say surrounds you. You know, the, the thing is, when trouble comes, the Bible talks about how that when the enemy will come in, he, he's looking to live, he's looking to stay, he's looking to dwell and be in the, some of those secret places. He wants to come in, he wants to stay, but he wants to surround you so that everywhere you look, you just see that particular sin, that particular weight, that particular problem in your life. I, I can't get any relief from it. I can't get any help from it. I, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. Every time I turn around, every, you know, everywhere. I look, there is my besetting sin or my weight that is there to pull me down. But you have a security system. You really do. You really do. You have adversaries. Oh, yes. But you have a security system. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Now, imagine being a soldier, 
living in medieval times, putting on a full suit of armor every day before you leave your house. That's really, that doesn't sound like fun at all. This armor protects you from the attacks of your enemy or your nemesis. The one that's trying to destroy you. Similarly, we need to equip ourselves with God's armor to be able to stand firm against the adversary. And we need to take the armor, and that needs to be the whole armor. Everyone say, whole armor. Say it with a little bit of enthusiasm. Whole armor. I want it all. And it talks about it there in the scripture, and it is described as truth. Truth. Sometimes it's very hard to tell the truth. You say, well, does that mean you're going to lie? Well, no, I'm just not going to tell you the truth. (laughs) I'm just not going to tell you anything. I'm just going to skirt the issue. Or if I say something, I won't tell you the whole truth. I'll just tell you a partial truth. Sometimes it's difficult to even face the truth. The mirror's not broken. Say that again. The mirror is not broken. (laughs) It is the truth. What you see there is what you get. Truth. And then there's righteousness. I'm going to get myself in big trouble today. Righteousness. The gospel of peace. Faith. Salvation. The helmet of salvation. Like I mentioned on that ride yesterday, I was thankful for the helmet I had on my head. It was a little bit hotter, but I'm going to tell you what. The dust didn't come in. The rocks at Caden was blowing up at me in front of me. It didn't hit me. I mean, it hit that, but it didn't hit me. I'll get him back. But anyway... A helmet of salvation, no June bugs or anything like that didn't come in. And I, I, I really appreciated the helmet that I had on. The helmet of salvation. And then there's the Word of God. And of course, if you read down through there, you'll, you'll talk about how you need to pray. You do have a security system. James chapter 4, verse number 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It's a promise. You need to submit yourself Therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He will flee. This is a promise. This is not just, well, possibly, you know, probably, uh, most likely, he will flee from you. No, if you submit yourself to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. One of the things that your enemy does not like is the fact that you submit yourself to the Word of God. That when you read the Word of God, you believe the Word of God, and you're going to live by the Word of God. Even when the Word of God doesn't fit your way of thinking, and it goes against what you want to hear, and you really don't like it, but it is the truth, and so the truth comes to your heart, and you say, I don't like this, and I don't like this truth, and I don't, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to submit myself to the Lord. Submission means that you really don't. Now, if we agree on something, we're not you know, I'm not going to submit to you. We are in agreement. But it's when we're in disagreement when submission comes into place. And the enemy does not like it when the Word of God comes to your heart and mind and soul and spirit, begins to talk to you, and you're thinking, I don't think that's important. What does that matter today? We're talking about stuff that happened years and years ago, years ago, beginning of time and all that kind of stuff, excusing everything that the Scripture teaches, how to dress, how to act, how to talk, being a man, being a woman, Living right, all of those different things. We could talk a long time about all of those things. But the Word of God declares those things, and the enemy doesn't like it when you read it and you say, well, I I don't know if it makes a big difference or not, but it's your Word, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to live by it. The devil doesn't like an individual that says, I'm going to take the Word of God for what the Word of God says, and that's how I'm going to live. He said, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm not going to fight with you because you're brainwashed. And if there's one thing America needs is a good brainwashing. Just didn't want to say. Uh-huh. Get on the internet for about five seconds and you will find and come to the conclusion that America needs a good brainwashing. And there's nothing better that, that can wash the brain of this country but the blood of Jesus Christ. 
nothing better that could come across and sweep across this nation but an apostolic Pentecostal revival that would deliver people from, you know, deception. Anyhow, I better get going. So there we are. And we have this security system. And submission and resisting, that's a twofold, that's a you know, two-step, that's a boom, boom, that's a one-two punch. And you've got to have somebody in your life. Everybody look at your name and you've got to have somebody in your life that can deliver the truth, that can talk to you. Now, you may not like it. it, it it's just the mailman. Don't, don't get wrong. It's just the mailman. All right? And if it's just the mailman, there's no sense going out there and cursing at the mailman because he just delivered a big bill into your mailbox. Right? You need, to, you need to talk to the one that sent the message or is the sender. Right? That's the one you need to be, be talking to. But there needs to be a place in your life where that someone can speak to you in such a way that you're going to have to submit to what they say. Now, I'm just going to let that sink in a little bit. You say, Pastor, do you have someone in your life that if they look at you and we talk about a situation and they say, do not do this, that you will not do it? I, I do. I may not like it. But there's got to be someone in your life that can say no. We're not going to like it because it all has to do with that submitting thing. We don't like to do that. But just kind of mix that into what I had here to say today. Put a smile on and say, and yeah, then we'll go on. But if you would, picture in your mind a strong fortified door with a sign that says no entry. You see, when we submit to God and resist the devil, it's like putting up that sign, locking the door to our nemesis and say, uh-uh, you're not coming in. You're not coming in. Now, let's just suppose that you have an unwanted roommate. Any of you that attended college, even Bible colleges and such, you get put in different dorm room, act, you know, situations and stuff, and you may have a roommate that you just really don't like. Any of you ever had that kind of an experience? You were in college, and you had, there's one hand going up there. Yeah, there's, there's another one going on there. Yeah, uh, You know, not that you, you know, really just totally disliked them completely, but you didn't want to live with them. I hope that was the case. Anyway, temptation, what, what, what we're going to call them temptation. We're just gonna, that roommate is temptation. And temptation is messy. Never picks up. Boy, the more I read this, my wife's going to kick me out this afternoon. Anyway, you're saying you're the temptation right there. Temptation is messy. Temptation never pays the rent. Temptation always eats your food, and no matter how many times you try to kick him out, he keeps finding his way back in. Until one day, you decide enough is enough, and this is what you do. You change the locks. He's never, she's never, that, that roommate. It's never going to get the message until they try to slide that key back in the door and the lock has been changed. At that point, temptation is going to get the hint and it's not going to knock on your door any longer. What are you saying, brother? There are some things that you used to have a problem with in your life that you have absolutely no problem here today. And temptation will not even stop at your door because you've done changed the lock. You're not worried about alcohol. You fought that battle years ago. You're not worried about a Goliath in your life that used to be there because you've done taking the head off from that giant. And when you take the head off the giant, Goliath is not going to, he's not going to come in and, and, and haunt you again. The champion's dead. And so you lock the door. You change the locks and you're free. Now, 
I have used up so much time. Let me just quickly go down through. Here's some practical steps to guard your spiritual house. Daily prayer and Bible study. Accountability partners. Avoiding the triggers. (laughs) In more ways than one. Regular self-examination. Check the status, the state of your spiritual house. Are there any weak points? Are there any places that you haven't been in for a while? And if there is an issue, address them promptly. Remember that the nemesis, the nemesis is looking for a place to live, to stay in your spiritual house. Let's stand. In the ninth chapter of the book of Joshua, Joshua and the assembly of leaders of Israel get themselves in a big pickle. Everyone say big pickle. In short, the Gibeonites have used all sorts of tricks to deceive Joshua and the men of Israel into making a peace treaty with them, even though they are their neighbors. Joshua's era, you can read about in verse number 14 of that ninth chapter. And just to make a long story short, instead of a short story long, what preachers do a lot of times, the men of Israel sampled the provisions of the Gibeonites. You see, the Gibeonites wanted to make a treaty that the Israelites wouldn't kill them because they were killing everybody else. They were invading the land. They were kicking people out. They were taking the land that God had given to them. So the Gibeonites said, you know what? If we can make a league with these guys, then uh, we'll be okay, you know? They say, how's that kind of go? You, you uh, keep your friends close and you keep your enemies closer. Hmm. So that's what they were doing. They want to keep their enemies closer. They wanted to make a deal with them. And so they went to them and they, they told them, we're from a long, long way off. You know, I mean, here they were in Maine. They were talking like they were from Alabama or something like that. And they were just, just talking in a particular way. They were presenting themselves. They were old and old clothes on. And the food that they had with them was, was all moldy and, and uh, dried up and, and all of that. Like that they had been on this long journey. The only thing is they just come across the street, basically. But they came to them and said, we want to make a deal. And uh, we heard about all that God has done for you and how all the people have been killed, but we, we just want to make a deal. And the Israelites did. They made a deal that they wouldn't kill them. But if you read in those verses, it talks about in verse number 14, the men of Israel sampled their provisions. Yeah. They looked at everything that they presented to them. Yeah, it looked okay. But did not inquire of the Lord. They looked with their eyes and they heard with their ears and maybe they even tasted some of their moldy bread with their mouth. But they did not inquire of the Lord. They did not ask of the Lord. They did not speak with the Lord. They did not pray to the Lord. And therefore they were deceived. Gibeonites were their enemies. Joshua was meant to completely destroy them all. But because he did not inquire of the Lord. He now is tragically making a deal with the enemy. The nemesis. The nemesis was right there in their own house, right there beside them, making a deal. And because they did not inquire of the Lord, they were deceived and they lost out on the promises of God. You say, what do you mean? They lost parts of the promises of God and had to live with their nemesis because they did not inquire of the Lord. 
Now, I want to, I'm going to be very frank with you, this church, and you young people, and you parents of young people. Things seen as being so good, being so helpful, being so protective. But when can you trust a young man, a young girl with just a device like this? You may want to inquire of the Lord. You may want to look a little deeper than the advertisements of Verizon. There are some activities that you may want to ask God about. God, what about this? It looks all right. It looks like the right place to go and the right thing to do. But if you're not careful, the nemesis of your home, your household, your family will be right there beside you and you'll not recognize it. You must inquire of the Lord. Is this something? Is this something? Is this someone? Is this spirit something I want in my house? I want you to bow your head as we think about this for just a moment. And I got to ask you the question and we're going to sing. And I know we're pushing the limits here just a little bit, but bear with me today. What is it that surrounds you? What is it that confines you? What is it that distracts you from your full potential in Jesus Christ? What is it that keeps you from receiving all that Jesus Christ has promised you? What is it that keeps you from receiving all of that? The things that you would receive if you would simply take up your cross and follow him. Many, many people follow. You can read about it in the scripture, but they forget the cross. Many people follow, but they, fi- they fail to allow Jesus Christ to be both Lord and their Savior. What is it that you could apply to the doorposts of your house? That would keep the nemesis out. Save nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood that Jesus shed for us. I want us to just think about this for just a moment. Jesus' name. I love you, Lord. I worship you, God. I magnify and lift up your name. What is it today that could keep you from being everything that God wants for you to be? Let's sing this chorus one time. Blood that Jesus shed way back. is against you in the name of Jesus you the nemesis of our souls you the one that wants to destroy us we rebuke in the name of Jesus spirit of deception and depression spirit of fear and doubt spirit of unbelief in the name of Jesus I come against you in the name of Jesus